All right, here we go. All right, so today I'm humbled and honored to be here with Ian Clark. He is the founder and one of the lead developers of the Freenet project. Freenet is an open source networking project that seeks to create a decentralized, uncensorable internet that is free for anybody to use. And it's done a really good job of doing that. He received a Fudo Legendary Grant recently. Fudo Legendary Grants are grants given out to people and projects that have done excellent work in the world of returning freedom of their technology back to the user where it belongs, whether it is a platform, a piece of hardware, or a piece of software. It's our way of saying thank you with no strings attached. And there are links down below, as well as a questionnaire and an email process for anybody interested in these grants. So thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. So can you just uh, introduce yourself a little bit, a so brief yeah, overview? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Ian Clark. Um, I, uh, I have a degree in computer science and artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm probably best known as the creator of Freenet, um, which started out as an open, as a undergrad project uh, that I did while studying uh, computer science and AI at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, yeah, since, uh, since doing that, that's kind of been an ongoing project ever since. Um, but I've done a bunch of other stuff, everything from uh, machine learning, uh, online advertising. I think most of my career I've spent as a software architect, uh, uh, designing software on large scale, uh, building and running engineering teams, that type of stuff. So this is a quote, Freenet attempts to remove the possibility of any group imposing its beliefs or values on any data. What may be acceptable to one group of people may be considered offensive or even dangerous to another. In essence, the purpose of Freenet is to ensure that no one is allowed to decide what is acceptable. This is not a quote from a year or two ago. This is a quote from over 20 years ago. So you seem to have been about 20 years ahead of your time. <laughs> Story of my life. Because yeah. I remember trying out Freenet in 2003 when I was 14 years old, just thinking, mm -hmm. oh, this is a cool project. What, you know, why is censorship an issue? Like, I don't, I don't see censorship as an issue on the internet at all. Mm -hmm. And you saw it as an issue in the late 90s, enough to act on it. Yeah, I mean, it, it really started while uh, I got to university, which was really my first exposure to the internet. And around about that time, people would kind of say things like the internet roots around censorship. And there was this real perception of, of the internet as this decentralized, anarchic place. But as I was learning about how uh, the internet worked, I realized that it was actually the opposite, that this was potentially the most easily controlled, censored, monitored technology that had yet been created. It's very difficult to kind of open everyone's snail mail, but it's very easy to read everyone's email when you control the, the infrastructure. And so I started to think about what, how would you build a layer on top of the internet that would allow people to communicate without fear of censorship, whether it's by government or, or uh, powerful organizations. And then at the same time, um, just technically, I was very interested in this uh, area called emergent systems. And emergent systems, you see them throughout nature. So um, an emergent system is any time where you have a large number of individual simple components. And when you put them all together and let them interact, they exhibit sophisticated behavior on a large scale. So the classic example would be an ant colony. Ants are really dumb. They've got like 900 neurons. They follow very simple rules. Yet you put a few thousand, a few thousand of them together, and they can build a colony, defend it, feed themselves, reproduce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so I was very, very interested in that technically. And at that time, and really since, nobody had ever built a, nobody had ever designed a system that relied on this kind of emergent architecture type approach. And I eventually realized that uh, if, if somebody were to uh, build a decentralized internet that was not subject to this kind of control, emergent architectures have all of the properties that you would want such a system to have. They tend to be decentralized. They tend to be highly survivable. So if you've ever had a problem with ants, you can stamp on the ants all day. The, the ant colony is not going to collapse. Um, and so I set about designing an architecture based on these principles that would allow people to publish and consume information without having to worry about people looking over their shoulder.
So you've said that members of the tech oligopoly have censored accurate information. And one of the people I subscribe to on YouTube, uh, Eli the Computer Guy, has over a million subscribers. And he had said in a video at a year ago that his wife and him got the vaccine because of a concern about his wife who had had three cancers. And his video was taken down for talking negatively about this vaccine, even though the statement he said was not only harmless, but also factual if you ask any doctor. Now, as the creator of an uncensorable anonymous network, can you expound on your thoughts on internet censorship in a world where about three to four companies control Control, who has the right and ability to say certain things? Mm. Well, I, I think the, the pandemic has really illustrated this problem maybe maybe better than anything else. Uh, probably the um, uh, the example that, that most easily springs to mind for me is the lab leak theory, the theory that, um, uh, that the uh, COVID-19 began in a, in a lab in Wuhan and that information was censored online. The The experts early in the pandemic all came out and said, no, it's definitely not a lab leak. Uh, of course, we now know that they were all kind of conflicted because a lot of them had relationships with the lab in, in Wuhan. And, and I think it's now pretty much consensus, not definite that it was an, a lab leak, but that it was more likely than not that it was a lab leak. Uh, so the, there was that and many other examples. And I think, one of the one of the things that has changed over the last 20 years is 20 years ago the concern was really government censorship we were thinking about the chinese government uh the government in iran and other countries around, around the world where the internet is censor censored but what we've learned particularly over the past five to ten years is that when the public square is privately owned, which is essentially the situation we're in with the internet, a handful of companies control the infrastructure, then it doesn't really take government censorship. It, it, censorship can happen because of a private company and they can not only remove your voice, they can remove your, your bank account, they can make it pretty much impossible to function in the modern world if they don't like what you're saying. And I view that as really a threat to democracy. And you viewed it as that 15 or 20 years before it actually was one, which is really ahead of its time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so like one of the issues that I see here is it's not, it's not even about when you, get some, when you say something wrong, it's when you say something right, but some stupid algorithm or somebody who barely understands English whose job 18 hours a day is to go through all these complaints and just randomly decide whether or not the AI farting did something correct or wrong has the ability to take down something that you worked for for 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the kind of automated stuff, but it, the question I ask people when they defend that kind of censorship, which a, lo a lot of people do, um, is who do, who do you trust to be the censor? Do you trust Mark Zuckerberg uh, to, no. control, to have that level of control? Do you, do you trust uh, this political administration or maybe the next political administration, it's which like might be the other party? Who do you trust? Yeah, I try to explain it as if you've been to the, you know, if you've tried to file an insurance claim and the, you know, you, you call up uh, your insurance provider and they say, oh, this this particular appointment is not covered under uh, under your insurance plan. Mm -hmm. Or like, do you, do you want to trust that type of person, like the type of person who is just sitting there 18 hours a day, eyes glazed over, just going through all this stuff with some of the most important things in your life? Absolutely. And your ability to communicate, your ability to share, your ability to do business. And I would say no. Mm hmm so you've said you cannot guarantee freedom of speech and enforce copyright law. Powerful words. Now, our founder here has said that selfish content creators can't tolerate losing control over the distribution of their work. If they want to be uncancelable, at some extent, you have to relinquish this control, your ability to say exactly who can get their content. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit more about the fact that you can't guarantee freedom of speech and enforce copyright law? Yeah, I mean, this this was really much more of an issue 20 years ago than today. Um, back when Freenet first kind of started getting a lot of public attention, it was in the context of Napster and uh, people sharing predominantly copyrighted music online. And the perception was that whereas Napster was centralized and therefore could be shut down, and of course was shut down for that reason, uh, the perception was that Freenet was decentralized and couldn't be shut down, which was true. The difference was that with Freenet, we really weren't thinking about how to help people kind of get the latest Britney Spears album for free. We were thinking much more about political speech and that type of stuff. But w it, it's simply the case with copyright that uh, in order to enforce copyright, you have to be able to limit 
who can share what information with other people. And my philosophy with freedom of speech in a nutshell or freedom of communication is that if two people wish to exchange information and it's a kind of consenting relationship, then they should be free to do so without the interference of any third party, whether it's their government or whether it's, it's uh, their email provider or, or anything else. With copyright, yeah, you, you need to be able to control how people share information. So there's a fundamental incompatibility between an absolutist perspective on freedom of communication like I have and enforcing copyright law. Yeah, there's one interesting line on your website, and again, this is just ahead of its time. Alternatives to copyright, and you talk about the simplest is voluntary payment and a patronage system. We actually practice what we preach in this regard. On March 15, 2001, the Freenet Project started taking donations, and in a week, you got $1,000. Mm-hmm. And this is you know, like almost 20 years before sites like Patreon or, or Patreon or you know, Streamlabs for donations and any mm-hmm. of this stuff existed. Mm-hmm. And there was this one kid I remember on Twitch. He was he, he had like a little Casio keyboard and he would just play stuff. And after eight minutes of playing music, he had two hundred seventeen dollars in donations. Mm. And he was just working out of his room. He looked like he was a sixteen or seventeen year old kid. And uh, that that model actually does work. There mm. are a lot of people that are more than happy to say, "I'm not interested in this album that costs three million dollars to produce. I'm not paying fifteen bucks for that." But this is a cool performance. I'll give this kid twenty bucks for playing. Yeah, we we did a lot of thinking back then because w- when you tell people you can't enforce copyright it prompts the question, well, how do you reward creativity without copyright? And uh, we actually, uh, we came up with an idea uh, which we called Fair Share back then, which was really akin to, quite quite similar to uh, what Patreon later became in that it was kind of voluntary donations. And people at that time were like, there's no way voluntary donations will be uh, kind of sufficient to reward people in the way that copyright is. But of course, we've learned since that, you know, you can you can raise millions of dollars on Kickstarter uh, just through voluntary donations simply because people want something to exist. Yeah. So the original Freenet paper is one of the most cited papers I've seen in computer science over the past two decades. So there's a lot of academics that understand it deeply. But for those who are, are not like deeply involved in computer science, can you just kind of briefly describe what the original Freenet was? And you, you've described your inspiration for creating it, but to mm. tell us a little bit about what the original Freenet project was. Yeah, so, so the, the original software, and, and really the new software, is a, it's some software that you download to your computer, you run it on your computer, and it creates a layer on top of the internet that, in the case of the original Freenet, is, is kind of like a shared hard disk, in that uh, anyone can publish to this shared hard disk, and anyone else can access information on this shared hard disk. And it's all kind of secured through cryptography. But yeah, to, to using the original Freenet, you use it through your web browser. So you can visit a, a website or we call them free sites uh, in your web browser. It's a lot slower than the internet. Uh, it's faster today, but it, it's uh, still relatively slow. Um, but you can consume information that way and you can also build other things like email-like services on top of it. But the original Freenet um, was, you know, pretty slow and again, kind of like a hard disk. And one of the things that, um, the big differences with Locutus, which is the new project, is that it's much more akin to an entire computer. You can actually do computation in a decentralized way and you can build quite complex decentralized software on top of this platform. So it kind of takes the original Freenet concept, firstly makes it a lot faster to use, makes it a lot more flexible, makes it a lot easier to use. Uh, the original Freenet software I kind of describe as hobbyist grade uh, software. It was very much a kind of experimental. And despite that, we probably had 7 million downloads of the software over the past 20 years. But really with, with Locutus, the idea is to create something that's, quote, consumer grade, something that's very easy to install, easy to use, and is really able to provide a replacement for most of the services that people use the internet for today except completely decentralized where you're not beholden to any third party. So Freenet was open source, uncensorable, anonymous, and decentralized. 
Locutus is your new project, and that seems to be focused for more where the internet is in 2022. Mm -hmm. You know, when you came out with this in the year 2000, you didn't have YouTube. I mean, the best that you had is every now and then you'd have ads that played in real player. Mm -hmm. There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. You had, mm -hmm. you know, PHP, BB forums, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So what is Locutus going to do that's different from original Freenet? Because Freenet had a lot of stuff that was ahead of its time, like, you know, mm -hmm. distributed hash tables, cryptographic contracts, a lot of this stuff, you know, that, that people talk about when they talk about decentralized, decentralization and blockchain now. This was radical like 22 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. But what is Locutus doing differently than Freenet? Um, it's, so, it's really, I think, I think the point about being a full computer versus just the hard disk kind of gets to the core of it. Um, so you can, peers in Locutus can kind of run software on behalf of each other in a way that's safe. Uh, we use WebAssembly, which is kind of a, a modern replacement for JavaScript uh, to do this. But from the user's perspective, the idea is that you could build uh, an email-like system on top of it. You could build an instant messaging-like system on top of it. You could build a Twitter-like system on top of it. All of these are kind of, or most of those are, require real-time communication, which is something Locutus is capable of the, that the original Freenet was not. So what makes Locutus capable of that type of real-time communication in a way that Freenet doesn't while remaining decentralized? Because while the original Freenet project is cool, I remember in 2003, like having what was considered fast back then, 768 kilobit per second DSL, but loading like a 30 kilobyte website would take, you know, upwards of 10 minutes, mm -hmm. which is, you know, something that wouldn't work for something like a modern Twitter or Facebook that would be run mm -hmm. on top of it. So how, how does Locutus solve that problem while remaining decentralized? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the, the core idea behind Locutus, and this is really the same core idea behind Freenet, is something called a small world network. Uh, so you may be familiar with the notion of six degrees of separation. The idea of small world networks originated in the 1960s. A social scientist called Stanley Milgram um, did an experiment, actually did many experiments, one of which was... Um, uh, the Stanford prison experiment, which is probably his best known experiment, uh, but that's a digression. Uh, but yeah, so Stanley Milgram did this experiment where he went to a bunch of people in Kansas and kind of the middle of the country, and he gave them all letters with the names of somebody in Boston, Massachusetts that they didn't know. And he, he told them, you got to get this letter to this person, but you can only send it, get it to them by sending it to somebody that you know personally. And they can only get it by sending it to someone they know personally. And so he ran this experiment with hundreds of letters. And of the letters he, that arrived, he discovered that the median number of people they went through in order to get to their destination was six. So this is pretty incredible. In a country of almost 300 million people at the time, you could get from one person to any other person in just six steps. That's crazy. Just by going through kind of personal relationships, people uh, that they know personally. And this was an entirely decentralized per process, of course, because it's just depending on what the people that each individual knows. And that's really the, the, the core principle behind uh, Freenet and Locutus. So peers in the Locutus network self-organize into a small world network. It turns out that if you just kind of randomly connect people together, you're not going to get a small world network. The network has to have this particular property where two peers in the network that are close together need to be much more likely to be connected than two peers which are far apart. So this small world network is what would make Locutus different from Freenet in terms of snappiness? Um, to run. It's, it, well, it, not exactly. They, they both rely on the small world network. In terms of speed, the, the key idea with Locutus is that with Freenet, you push data into it, and then at some point in the future, somebody retrieves that data. With Locutus, you push data into it and other people can subscribe to that data. And so when it changes, when it's updated, they are notified instantly of the update or like where instantly is hopefully less than a second. Um, so that's kind of, it, it's called an observable key value store. And the observable refers to the fact that you can watch some data in Locutus 
and be notified immediately when it changes. Now, being something that's decentralized and also uncensorable, how do you would you deal with potential masses of spam on this? Like, is this an append only data structure, or how would you, how would you deal with that? So it's not an append only data structure. Data in Locutus is mutable, um, so so you can push data into it and then you can update it, and the criteria for how you update the data is specified using a cryptographic contract, which I can speak a, a little bit more about how that works. But in terms of preventing spam, uh, you can build systems on top of Locutus. And so one of the systems that uh, were, we've designed, uh, we call them anti-flood tokens. And so this is where you can, you get a, you create a token generator, uh, which you can do in a variety of ways. The easiest, probably the, the simplest way is, is you make a donation to Freenet uh, and then we'll allocate a token generator to you and we'll provide other more decentralized mechanisms in the future. But then once you have a token generator, it'll generate tokens at some fixed rate. So it might be once every five minutes, it might be once an hour, it might be once a day. And if you want to, let's say uh, we were using an email-like system on top of Locutus and I wanted to send you an email, you might say, hey, I want to, uh, if you want to send me an email, you got to spend a five minute token, which means I have to take one of my tokens that are generated every five minutes and spend it in order to get my uh, email into your inbox. Now, if you find you're getting too much spam, you can raise the threshold. You can say, I want a 30 minute token or a two hour token, which is effectively raising the bar for what it takes to get into your inbox. And so this is, a simple mechanism that relies on cryptography uh, that can create a cost for sending messages or doing other things that, that might cause spam. Then we're uh, also building a more sophisticated system, which is a web of trust-based reputation system, uh, such that you might say, well, if you want to send me a message, you've got to put some reputation on the line. And then if I send you a message and it turns out it's spam or you don't like it for what for any other reason, you can give me feedback which will be visible to anyone else who uh, is aware of my reputation. So there are these kind of systems that you can build on top of Locutus that can address problems like spam. Hmm. What is the difference fundamentally between something like Tor and Freenet? There are a variety of differences. Uh, Probably the main one is that Tor, uh, Tor, there's a Tor network, which are Tor relays, which I think there are maybe two, four thousand, there might be more now. Um, but these are, these relays have a privileged status within the Tor network. And if you're just using Tor as a user, you're not running one of these relays. So you're not really contributing back to the network. Uh, with Locutus, if you're using Locutus, you're contributing back to the network to the extent that you can. Obviously, if you're running Locutus on a cell phone, you probably don't want it using vast amounts of data eating up your battery. But to, but to the extent you're willing to contribute back to the network, you can do so. And so I, I would describe Locutus as more of a kind of true peer-to-peer -peer in that participants in the network also form part of the network. And that's different to Tor. I think Tor, uh, core goal of Tor is to provide anonymity. Like that, that's really the point. Uh, the core goal of Locutus is to be decentralized. You, we can, you can build anonymity services on top of Locutus, but Locutus, uh, anonymity is not kind of baked into the Locutus operating system itself. Rather, it's a service that can be built on top of mm. Locutus. So you've mentioned frustration with the fact that reputation systems now are behind walled gardens. And by reputation systems, we mean eBay feedback, Yelp reviews, Google reviews, Uber reviews. And you had mentioned Yelp and Uber in your presentation. And that got me thinking, you know, I, I could have an amazing reputation on Yelp as a repair shop owner and a garbage reputation on Uber as a driver, for anybody who's probably watched my driving streams can attest to. Um, so can you talk about the reputation system in Locutus and how this would work? If you have a decentralized reputation system, mm -hmm. uh, how would you deal with people having different uh, verticals for their reputation to be judged? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so fundamentally, I mean, this is, 
in, in a way, Locutus is my kind of answer to all of the ways that I think the internet has kind of gone wrong over the past 20 years in its architecture. Um, and one of the things that I think kind of went wrong was the internet went down this client server path where you've got a web server sitting in a data a kind of air-conditioned data center on a fast connection, and then you have clients which really just kind of consume information from the server. And one of the effects of that approach is that uh, people who are building services on the internet really kind of have a, a disincentive to make those services talk to, talk to each other a lot of the time. There was a time like about maybe kind of late 2000s, like 2007-ish, where it became very fashionable to build APIs for your service. So Twitter had an API, Facebook had an API, Reddit had an API. And the idea was these things should be components that can, can interact with each other. But of course, what, what they discovered was that the way people would use the APIs would sometimes cause spam, uh, or they would sometimes undermine the business model of the services. And so most of them shut down their APIs. The Twitter API is a lot less functionality than it used to have. Uh, Facebook kind of more or less shut down their API. Reddit, I think, more, more or less kept theirs. The way it should work, and I would kind of describe this as the Unix philosophy, is you really want to build software in such a way that you have simple interoperable components. And that's what kind of accelerates innovation. And that's really, so what I want to do with Locutus is you can build interoperable components like a reputation system that multiple different services can be built upon so that we don't get the current kind of walled garden situation. So with, with Locutus, the, the way we handle reputation is a mechanism called web of trust. And this is, this is not a new idea. It's something that has existed with email since the early 90s. And it's, we used it with the original Freenet as well. But the notion of web of trust is that you can trust, you can establish trust relationships with people that are transitive. So if I trust you and you trust somebody else, then I would, to some degree, trust the person that you trust. And so it kind of creates this web of trust that allows people to establish reputations. And the reputation, of course, can be for different stuff. I might have a good reputation as a software engineer, but not a good reputation as a gardener. And so reputation, is contextual as well, and this system can accommodate that. The difficult questions. If you have a network that is uncensorable, decentralized, anonymous, and open source, how do you prevent the detestable content from getting out there, the, the CSAM, the bombings, the mm -hmm. plannings of all, all sorts of horrible things, mm -hmm. and also the why are you not in jail? I remember one of the most upvoted comments on this thread discussing the new network was, you know, I had a bet with a friend in 2004. He said in 10 years, you would be dead or in prison. And I'm still waiting to collect on my bet. because <laughs> well, he, he keeps waiting. No, he was on the winning side of that one. So like, but oh, well. I mean, do, do people knock on your door? And like, I mean, from everything that, that shows in the Freenet paper, it really doesn't seem like you have any, there's no back door in this. There's no way to locate any of it. And that's really the protection. So uh, one of the <laughs> things that, that I say a lot, and it's true both of the original Freenet and of Locutus, is that if somebody put a gun to my head and say, hey, you know, we want the keys, <clears throat> we want to, you know, be able to shut down Locutus or, or uh, rem remove people's anonymity, I could not do it. It's a this great way to avoid getting a gun to your head. Exactly. Building it right the first time. E exactly, exactly. And so we, we kind of protect ourselves through the design by making it pretty much impossible for us to compromise the network or to, to uh, so there is no back door by, by design and that's part of what protects us. We've never had any negative interaction with law enforcement. Um, the, in fact, the interactions we have had with the US government have been positive. So we talked to what was then called the International Broadcasting Bureau who do Voice of America, Radio Free Europe and that type of thing. They were very excited about Freenet uh, because they thought it could be used in countries like China and Saudi Arabia to circumvent government censorship. 
so that hasn't been a problem in practice, fortunately. I mean, morally or ethically, like when you go to sleep at night, there's so many people that are probably benefited from being able to learn about the world that couldn't through this amazing technology. But does ever a part of you think, like, crap, there's somebody out there doing something screwed up on a network that I created? Or is it like, the, does the good outweigh the bad? I, th I think it's a case of the good outweighing the bad. I think when you think about the stakes, like for me, <coughs> the stakes are really democracy. Like you cannot, uh, the basic idea behind democracy is that the electorate chooses their own government. In order to make that choice effectively, the, the electorate needs to know what's going on. If the government can limit how they can communicate with each other, then they can't, they won't necessarily know what's going on or have an accurate view of it. And so they can't fulfill their role as voters. And so I see it as, as essential for democracy. And democracy is what protects us against everything else. If you don't have democracy, you don't have rule of law, you're essentially the, the powerless are subject to the whims of the powerful. And so that's the positive, which, which I view as a very, very big positive. Um, on the negative side, of course, any tool, there are things people can do with that tool that are going to be bad. Yeah, I remember logging into it before you came to do your presentation here at Fudo for the grant. And one of the things that I was expecting to see all this horrible stuff. And when I logged in, one of the second pages I clicked on was actually a rehabilitation page for people that had otherwise in the past viewed CSAM related content mm -hmm. and things like that. And yeah, they even if they're saying, I want to get better, I do not want to do this anymore, this is not who I want to be, I want to resist this shit, mm -hmm. they do not feel comfortable doing that on anything other than a completely decentralized, anonymized section of the internet. And it was like, it honestly, put a small smile on my face to see that you, well, what would be assumed to be this horrible platform, the second link that I clicked on was actually them trying to use it for something mm -hmm. uh, good. Uh, absolutely. And, and yeah, I mean, who's going to sign up for a website on that topic yeah. <laughs> no, uh, w without the protection of anonymity? Um, that, that's absolutely true. Now, there is an issue that you don't want somebody to fire up Freenet or fire up Locutus and be inadvertently exposed to something that, that they don't want to see. But for us, the, the, that's what the reputation system's job is. Um, so the reputation system as we're designing it, will also uh, form part of a search engine. So with, with Google, for example, the search results are ordered by Google's kind of secret sauce algorithm that uh, SEO type people seem to get better every day at, at figuring out how to circumvent. With this system, we use a reputation system in order to assess the quality of search results. And so that's part of how we make sure that you're not going to be kind of innocently using Locutus and suddenly get exposed to uh, some content that you know you're not going to like. It's funny because as good as good people claim Google search algorithms are, and they do a lot of good things right. That's like you know I can't find one of my own websites on DuckDuckGo, for instance. If there was this one guy that just changed the name of his business to MacBook Repair New York City because he couldn't outrank me, and after he changed his business name to MacBook Repair NYC. He was literally outranked me within a day. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you made your business name the search term mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you won. So if content is decentralized in nature, how does this affect longevity? Because there's some other blockchain kind of systems that have tried to distribute things like video. And one of the issues that I've seen some of these, these platforms have is they will have a CDN that is essentially propping up the network where 99% of the traffic is not being served by the peer-to-peer -peer part. It's being served by the CDN because the users are being uh, somewhat selfish and not choosing mm -hmm. to share content. So, you know, is uh, this being run without large nodes? Does this, is, do you, does this seem realistic? Yeah, so, so that's a great point. So one of the non-goals of Locutus is being for long-term storage of data. So this would distinguish it from something like IPFS, for example, which uh, is another um, uh, kind of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized storage system. But IPFS' explicit goal is to be for long-term storage of data, so kind of like a decentralized Dropbox. With Locutus, it's not about long-term storage of data. It's about kind of publishing data to people who want to consume it. If you want your data to stay on Locutus for a long period of time, it's up to you as the publisher to maintain it. And, and there's a mechanism where you can kind of uh, ensure that the data stays in the network. If you're not doing that, the approach Locutus takes, it's, 
what's called the least recently used cache, which is the more people that are accessing the data, the more widely distributed it will be in the network. If absolutely is nobody, if absolutely nobody is interested in it, then eventually it will fall out of the network unless the publisher of the data is kind of keeping it in the network. How is the reputation system not a form of censorship in and of itself? Well, because it's done entirely on behalf of the users participating in it. So the, the way I would define censorship is where you have two people, they want to share information, and some third party is preventing them from doing that. With the Locutus reputation system, it's entirely empowering the individual. You're deciding to use the reputation system. You're deciding who you're, tr who you're going to trust. So it's, it's really entirely driven by the individual user. So it's adjustable. It's like you, you having the choice to choose a channel on your television versus somebody else saying this channel is not available to you. A exactly. Like the, the analogy might be the safe search functionality in Google. It's entirely at the user's option. Um, and so I, I wouldn't consider it censorship for that reason. What are the security risks, if any, to the user of running Freenet? I don't think significantly different to running any other piece of software that's been written by a third party. With Locutus, Locutus is written in Rust, um, which uh, is a pretty modern programming language that's designed in such a way that a lot of the common security holes that occur in software are difficult or impossible in Rust. Um, so I don't think it's, I mean, obviously anytime you install some software on your computer that's been written by a third party, you kind of need to trust that the third part, you, you need a degree of trust in the third party. Uh, if that software is open source, then that makes it easier because at least people can audit the source code. And of course, Locutus and Freenet are open source. Uh, but there's, there's no way to eliminate that risk 100%. But it's certainly no worse than any other piece of software you might install. And in, in many ways, it's better. You've talked about not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Like Locutus will work inside of a web browser using a lot of standard protocols. How easy would it be for somebody to decide, I want to build an app that works on top of this? Like how much of the decentralization parts do they have to worry about versus mm -hmm. just programming an app that does what they want? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So. Um, the, the fundamental um, object within Locutus is called a contract. So Locutus is, it's a decentralized key value store. So key value store is just a simple dictionary, I think would be the Python term for it, or hash map would be the Java term for it. But the, the difference is that the keys in this key value store are code. The keys are WebAssembly code that describe what is a permitted value for this key and under what circumstances can that value be modified. And, and so these contracts, you, they loosely map to the concept of a database table. So if you were building a service, uh, more than likely that you'd be keeping your data in a database and you'd have kind of different database tables for that. Um, so with Locutus, the user interface is all in the web browser. So to build the user interface, you can use Vue.js or React or really any JavaScript web framework of which there are a growing number every day. The part that's different is the back end. So the back end with Locutus, you need to uh, use these contracts and uh, you can write your own contracts in WebAssembly so they can be written in Rust or uh, assembly script, which is kind of a, a JavaScript dialect that compiles to WebAssembly. That probably requires more expertise, but the, the good news is that you can also build components in Locutus that can be used by other people. So not everything, ha it's just, just like a, a computer, you've got the operating system, and then you have layers of components on top of that that get increasingly more sophisticated, so that essentially, eventually, if you want to build an application, you don't have to kind of build it from first principles every time. You can use pre-existing components and we'll provide a variety of pre-existing components. So that would make it a lot easier for people to actually create the next you know, Twitter or Facebook clone or something that could actually run on top of this. Yes, absolutely. We, we want to make it so that if, you're, if you have a little bit of experience using something like, say, React, for example, uh, you can pick up and start building stuff for Locutus uh, with a very small learning curve. Right. 
one more question and then I take some stuff from the audience. Can you explain how Locutus is different from Ethereum smart contracts? Yeah, so so I think the the key difference between Locutus and and uh, Ethereum or blockchain more generally is that with the blockchain, there this isn't one hundred percent true, but with the certainly the original Bitcoin design, every transaction in the blockchain had to be broadcast to everyone else. With Locutus, because we're using this small world network. It has much better scalability characteristics. Like if you have to broadcast every transaction to everyone, there's going to be a limit to the scalability there. And you see the effect of that in terms of the transaction cost with uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin and that type of thing. So Locutus is f the core idea in Locutus is fundamentally scalable. Small world networks are extremely scalable. They can, cons they can scale up to billions of nodes without significantly slowing down. With blockchain, they try to get around that with kind of L2 and various other things, but they're all kind of lipstick on a pig because the core design is based on this idea of broadcasting every transaction to everyone. Anonymity isn't a focus. What would be the use in China and Saudi Arabia since governments could still find out who did what? I mean, can they? Um, it's, it's really a question of effort, how much effort. I would say it would provide it would provide some protection uh not necessarily anonymity but simply the fact that there's no kind of well-known central server that ever th that is easy to kind of block and monitor for the chinese government but it's it's not the case that there can be no anonymity on Locutus. it's just not uh it's not kind of baked into the operating system rather it's a component that would run on top of the the operating system hmm. so you can still have anonymity uh, if you want it. What prevents a troll from hijacking the Freenet network by inputting a lot of contribution of junk? Yeah, so so in part the spam prevention mechanism that, that I mentioned earlier, um, there is a type of attack in, uh, in this type of network that's called a Sybil attack, which is essentially where you create a very large number of fake peers in the network and then you use the fact that you may now control a significant part of the network in order to do nefarious things. The approach that Locutus takes to addressing that problem is that peers in Locutus all watch each other. And if a peer is doing something bad, an example of that might be um, there's an update to some information that the peer doesn't pass along. Um, but the way that, that Locutus uh, Locutus addresses that is other peers in the network will immediately see if a peer is not doing that and peers just like people also have reputations so that would be a negative mark on that peer's reputation which would make it less likely for other peers to want to talk to it in future. What are your thoughts on the GCHQ, the United Kingdom's NSA? Yeah, I mean I, I would not consider myself an expert on it. <laughs> it's a uh, you know, I, I think whether it's the NSA or GCHQ, I think it, it just really demonstrates that kind of everything we're doing is monitored. And I think, of course, we've learned with the kind of Snowden revelations a, f a few years back. I mean, we, we just know that everything is everything is being monitored. If it can be monitored, monitored it probably is being monitored. Um, and so I think all of this kind of reinforces why the way that the internet is currently designed, which makes it very easy to do that kind of monitoring, that's problematic. How simple is this to use? Like, could you, know, when Locutus is done, could a computer literate grandparent use it? The way you described it is you're just going to an address in a browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you, you initially, you need to install the Locutus software, which will be a very small, very quick to install, kind of maybe comparable to installing a, a printer driver, which is pretty much automatic with, with Windows most of the time. So you install a piece of software and then from then on you just use your web browser to uh, talk to Locutus and to access and to interact with apps that are built within Locutus. So can Locutus run detached from the rest of the internet on a mesh network? That's a great question. So version 1.0, that's not a goal. Um, but one of the great things about this small world network kind of architecture is that it's extremely flexible. And one, one of the things that we pioneered with the original Freenet 
uh, this was back in 2005, is what at that time we called it darknet mode. Now, since then, darknet has kind of taken on a, a bit of a negative connotation. Uh, it didn't yeah. have that connotation when, when, we were, when we were using the term. But the idea behind darknet is that instead of your peer just talking to any other peers in the network, you could limit your peer to just talking to people that you know personally. And then we use the small world network idea to allow the network to self-organize into a small world network with the constraint that you don't control or with the constraint that the network does not control the actual connectivity between peers. And so that approach could be used to run Locutus as a mesh network, which I'm very excited about because one of my big concerns, um, and this is, uh, so, some might say paranoid, but a situation where we do have maybe major civil unrest where the internet infrastructure just goes down. And in that case, I think we're, you know, we really have a very serious problem because without a means of communication, it's going to be very difficult to kind of get our society back on track. I don't like how you were about 16 years ahead of your time predicting the censorship issue. And now you're predicting that, well, once there is complete civil unrest, it's like, <laughs> well, please I, be wrong. I'm not predicti- <laughs> predicting it. It's, it's, more a, please be uh, wrong. It, it's more a contingency. Um, it's good to be prepared. <laughs> yeah. And, and so in a situation like that, I think it's going to be essential that we have a global communication network that does not rely on this very centralized infrastructure and so uh, we've been looking at stuff like LoRa radio which is this kind of short range relatively kind of one two mile range radio so that we could run Locutus at, because I think part of it, it part of the problem if the internet does go down is we're all so dependent on these highly centralized data centers to run all of these services. So even if we could, even if we could still talk direct, communicate directly with other internet users, because WhatsApp is down and Google's down and Gmail's down, we're not actually going to be able to do anything. Whereas because Locutus actually runs on the peers of the people participating in the network, it's a way that you can provide decentralized services that would be able to survive a catastrophic collapse of the infrastructure. Is this similar to the Invisible Internet Project or like a pseudo Tor inter- Invisible Internet Project combination if the small network world is the goal? Um, so uh, the IIP, the uh, I2P, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I2P, um, it actually grew out of, I think the creator of I2P was, was involved in Freenet um, before they built I2P, but I, I think, in my mind, I2P is quite similar to Tor in that they're onion rooting networks. So I'm not sure, I haven't looked that closely at I2P in recent years, so it's possible that they've uh, moved more in the direction of mesh networking, but but so far as I'm aware, I, I don't think that's the goal of that project. Ah, the salty one. Okay, I forgot. This get, why would governments not just ban it and jail the creator? This is the million and first crypt, use cryptography to build a decentralized utopia project. The previous million didn't topple any entrenched power structure and never posed anything resembling a real risk of doing so. Why should the next one be a threat or the next hundred million of them and the salty part in parentheses? And no, this one also won't succeed because technology is not the thing that causes people to join centralized social networks and technology will not get them to leave either. The repeated belief that it's just a matter of the right technology coming along or being put together tends to show that the people behind these efforts don't actually understand the problem they're trying to solve. Uh, well, I, would, I was sorting the Reddit thread by Salty. To yeah. <laughs> well, I would disagree with that analysis. Um, I think really it is a fundamentally a technology problem. It's an architectural problem. The, the original architectural mistake was going with a client-server architecture. Uh, and the reason we went with a client-server architecture is that's how the World Wide Web worked. And the World Wide Web ended up being the killer, killer app of the internet for the most part. Um, so I think it, it is fundamentally an architectural problem. And as evidence of that, you can just look at the number of attempts at building decentralized networks over the years. Uh, Freenet was the first and, um, you know, and it, it works, people use it, it, you know, 
uh, it's kind of been ongoing development ever since. Uh, it was kind of, you know, has been kind of clunky, which is one of the problems we're addressing. But yeah, I, I, I think it's fundamentally this idea of how do you build decentralized services? It, it has not been a solved problem. And the reason why, I mean, I didn't, with Locutus, Locutus is maybe my fifth uh, attempt at kind of building a, a successor to Freenet. Um, and it was really when I kind of hit on the specific design of Locutus that I realized, you know, this is actually the right approach. And I just don't think that's existed before. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would disagree that it's a technology problem. It, it, it is a technology problem. The problem is that the la path of least resistance is centralized, and that's why everything is centralized. Uh, but my hope is that now the path of least resistance, or at least similar resistance, will be building decentralized services. How far along is this if somebody wanted to get this to beta test it? So we're, we're currently in development. The next kind of big milestone is where we'll release an SDK, uh, which will allow people to start experimenting with software on top of Locutus, and they'll be able to test it locally. And then the next kind of milestone after that will be taking those local decentralized apps and running them over the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and so we hope to have a, a prototype release uh, really in the next two to three months. That's the kind of timeline. We've been, we've been working on this for about two years in so, earnest. Now, we here at Fudo have given you a legendary grant to continue moving forward with this project. If other people would like to give a grant in order for you to continue this development of this, where can they find you? Uh, that would be great. Um, so you can go to freenet, all one word, dot org, and there's uh, information there both about Locutus and about the, the Freenet Classic. Um, and you're welcome to, uh, you know, I can be reached at ian at freenet.org, uh, which is kind of easy to guess. And so if you're interested, if you if you want to make a kind of small donation, you can do so via the Freenet website. You can do it in, uh, using a credit card, Bitcoin, Monero, whatever you want. Um, if, uh, you're in a position to provide a larger grant, then definitely send me an email and we'll talk. Ian, I-A-N at freenet.org. Right, and for the viewers out there, uh, there is an application process in the description below for anybody else who is interested in this grant process. We are looking to give grants out to people, projects, and organizations that have been focused on tech freedom and giving sovereignty of your devices, your software, your hardware, and your platforms back to the end user where it belongs. These are grants with no strings attached of anywhere from five, six, and sometimes seven figures to people who've been doing excellent work in this field. We wanna hear from more of you. Do email down below, and there is a little list of questions. You just answer those, and that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really Thanks appreciate much, it. Lewis. All right.